Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. If you have arthritis, you're not alone. At least you're not alone. More than 50 million Americans, probably more than that, have arthritis. And that means one in every five adults in addition to 300,000 children. It is the number one cause of disability in this country. Now, the first steps in conquering arthritis are learning the facts, understanding your condition, and knowing that help is available. Mayo Clinic has a book, don't they? Absolutely. Mayo Clinic has a book, the highly acclaimed book, Living with Arthritis, How to Manage Pain and Lead an Active Life. And joining us on today's program is one of the editors of Living with Arthritis, Mayo Clinic rheumatologist, Dr. John Davis. Welcome back to the program. Thank you so much, uh, Tom. Tracy, I really appreciate the opportunity. So uh, I know that this book has been in highly successful. Uh, a lot of people have read it. So congratulations to you and your colleagues on, mm-hmm. on, on a great book. Our listeners would like to know, uh, what exactly is arthritis? The term is a little bit confusing because I think arthro comes, means joint. Itis means inflammation of the joint. So tell us what really happens. I think... The challenge with arthritis is it's such a broad term, and um, really there are many, over 100 different kinds of arthritis, but uh, the main thing, inflammation does occur in joints, and to me that's what arthritis means, but the causes are very diverse. There are two main um, types of arthritis, one being degeneration of the joint, that is that the cartilage kind of breaks down, an underlying bone breaks down, and that leads to inflammation. That is mainly called osteoarthritis, which is the most common type of arthritis. And as you pointed out, Tom, leads to the most disability um, really of any condition in the United States right now. And then other types are inflammatory, and rheumatoid arthritis is the most common form of inflammatory arthritis. And that is where the immune system basically begins to attack a person's own joints and causes pain and and, uh, disability uh, on that basis. So those are the, the major differences. Can a patient have both osteo and rheumatoid arthritis? It's very common for patients with rheumatoid arthritis to also have osteoarthritis. Mm-hmm. The other situation is less common, of course, because rheumatoid affects um, about 0.5 to 1% of people uh, you know, worldwide, and osteoarthritis is very common, especially with age. It, it, above you know, 70, it, almost most patients have uh, osteoarthritis to some degree. So, so it's it really a disease of the, of the cartilage, right? The cartilage uh, and the end of the bone wears out, and it's like the glistening part of the end of a chicken bone. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's a good a good description of, of the degenerative arthritis form that you talked about, osteoarthritis. That's right. And rheumatoid arthritis, how is that different? Well, in rheumatoid arthritis, inflammation is occurring in the lining of the joint. That's called synovitis. Okay. Um, and so if you if you think about jello almost, um, if you open up the joint, you would see this sort of gelatinous material um, that really is the inflammation occurring. And so the reason that the, the lining of the joint expands is because white blood cells are rushing into the joint uh, through the bloodstream to attack the joint, and that causes swelling uh, of the lining. But in both cases, it's the cartilage that gets destroyed. Uh, The cartilage and the bone, that's right. Mm -hmm. Both men and women experience these the same? Um, I would say that osteoarthritis is pretty balanced. Rheumatoid arthritis is about three to one, female to male ratio, Mm. and so more common among women. And most autoimmune diseases have a bit of a gender bias, so that women are more commonly affected than men, although men too. Symptoms of both types? Similar, you know, very similar overall. I think um, the, the major symptoms of arthritis in general are pain, stiffness or loss of mobility of a joint. Oftentimes stiffness is, is accentuated after a prolonged inactivity or first thing in the morning. Um, fatigue, tiredness, these are other symptoms that commonly affect patients. Okay, so every morning when I get up and <laughs> it, it, there is stiffness in my ankles, my knees, the whole way around, is that arthritis? You know, stiffness is a, is a, is a pretty, you know, uh, undifferentiated term mm-hmm. uh, and goes along with a lot of different conditions, including just normal life and maybe not sleeping so good, stress. So this can cause people to feel stiff in the morning. The difference is that in people with, um, with arthritis, it's, it's the joint that's stiff and there is limitation of motion that limbers up after exercise first thing in the morning or with, inactiv- mm-hmm. or with uh, exercise during the day. Rheumatoid arthritis, the stiffness tends to be more severe and more prolonged. Mm -hmm. And so it often may last more than an hour before it begins to limber up. It's usually better by the time I get to the coffee pot. (laughs) (laughs) And a couple of 
pills will yeah. help you too. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, osteoarthritis, by far and away the most common. The wear and tear arthritis. Mm-hmm. Age, obviously, the most common risk factor. So let's talk about the treatment options. And let's start with, uh, if, if you see a patient who ha- has mild osteoarthritis, but it's interfering with uh, some of the things that they would like to do, and it's painful, how do you go about choosing a treatment regimen? Yeah, I think it's, you know, you have to individualize, and part of it is what treatments seem most agreeable to a given person. But I think uh, the basic things are we have medications that can help, and we have sort of non-medication approaches. Um, I would often encourage physical therapy and exercise early on. So for knee arthritis, we can do exercises to strengthen the muscles around the knee to better support the joint and support the cartilage. Um, that's a good option. Uh, if, if there's a lot of pain at night or if there's a lot of more swelling infl- uh, inflammation type symptoms, sometimes joint injections can be helpful. So we inject steroid right into the joint. Um, in terms of day-to-day pain management, we, we consider acetaminophen uh, for mild pain. Um, patients often get better response with what drugs that are called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So that's your ibuprofen um, or naproxen that you can get over the counter. Um, those medications help, and we try to use those uh, somewhat sparingly and maybe on an as-needed basis as opposed to every day um, because there can be some side effects and risks that go along with those medications. Um, for example, stomach ulcers can occur, have to watch the blood pressure as blood pressure can become elevated in those patients, um, and maybe watch kidney uh, function over time too. But um, those are some treatments that can definitely help. Part of it is about uh, managing activities and sort of trying to do certain tasks differently so they don't cause flare-ups. What about uh, any creams or topical things that you could put on? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, There are some topical creams that sometimes we use. People use things like uh, various freezes that are available over the counter. Um, uh, There are some uh, actual anti-inflammatory gels that one can place. Something called diclofenac gel is a cream that can be rubbed on, or actually a gel that can be rubbed on joints can have some anti-inflammatory benefits. So so people try different things in, in, in forms of that, and I think that can be helpful. Capsaicin cream is another one that people use. I think back in uh, September, I saw uh, the Arthritis Foundation came out with something about CBD Mm. being like, uh, maybe it's giving some patients some relief. Um, Are you aware of that announcement? And what what about CBD? So I I guess CBD, my take on CBD is, um, you know, it's out there and people are trying it. Uh, That much is very clear. And I'm very open-minded about it partly because I know patients need better options for pain management in arthritis, and so I'm hopeful that we can find some new things. Um, CBD, you know, coming from hemp, and which is now available in many different stores that have proliferated around Rochester and other parts, um, has some challenges, but I have seen people uh, report a lot of benefit, a lot of better control of pain and, and stiffness in osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis and probably other diseases too. Others have not gotten so much benefit, and so I think it's been kind of hit or miss in my practice and people have, what people have tried. Part of the challenge is, is how um, good the product is that people are buying, and there's a great deal of variability in terms of whether, whether or not the products contain the amount of CBD they say that, that, that is there, and also whether or not it contains THC, which is the part that causes more of the high of, mm-hmm. uh, of cannabis and really marijuana as far as the illegal product. Um, and, um, and, and it can cause some side effects, actually. So those are some of the issues. I think we need, um, first of all, you know, better products. They're more reliable. We need more knowledge about what the benefits and risks are. Mm-hmm. There are some interactions with other medications that people have to be aware of. And, and in general, I think important for patients, um, if they're interested in CBD, to talk to their healthcare provider or physician to go over what the particular benefits or risk might be. Yeah. They have incomplete knowledge, but at least they can help some. You buy two jars of it, one jar might work, the other jar wouldn't. There's no way for you to know. That's true. Are there any prescription medications that are better than what you can buy over the counter for pain? That's a, it's a great uh, question, Tom. I think not necessarily. You know, and some people actually, I, I try to prescribe a, a prescription NSAID or non steroidal anti inflammatory drug, and they prefer just the over the counter, you know, leave or, or ibuprofen. Um, those can work very well. Um, a couple things. One is that if you don't like taking pills as often, prescription strength forms often can, can be taken less often, even once daily or twice daily, as opposed to, you know, for ibuprofen, you have to take it three or four times a day to get mm-hmm. 24 hours of coverage, if you will. Um, there also is one uh, medication called celecoxib, 
which is more, um, it's, a, it's, it's a sort of a selective medication that doesn't interfere with the stomach as much and so has a lower risk of causing gastrointestinal side effects or stomach ulcers. And that often uh, is, is a benefit too. But um, it depends on the situation and maybe other health problems. Sometimes we have to try three or four to find what works best because people are different. Uh, and can have you know unique effects of different medications, including the NSAIDs. All right, I want to ask you about some alternative treatments. First of all, glucosamine chondroitin sulfate. A lot of people taking it. Is there evidence that it actually helps? I would say overall the evidence is pretty weak that it actually helps. There was a large uh, trial sponsored by um, the, the federal government in the United States that did not report overall benefit. There was a subgroup of people who had very high pain from osteoarthritis who did have benefit. However, in Europe, um, they use a different formulation. They use glucosamine sulfate as opposed to glucosamine hydrochloride, which is the form that I believe was done in the United States trial. And they did find evidence of some benefit in a randomized controlled trial, which is the best type of data we know of. So I think it's um, controversial. I think in general, the evidence is pretty weak that it's effective, but it probably has low risk. And I guess I'm open to patients trying it for a short period of time. And if they feel it helps them, I'm, I'm open to that possibility. Who's to argue? That's what about other vitamins and supplements? Any out there that you have recommended mm -hmm. to your patients or suggest that they try? You know, a lot of supplements out there, as you know. Um, I have had people get benefit from turmeric. Mm -hmm. and, um, and some people really think that it does have some anti-inflammatory effects. Are they taking capsules or are they drinking... I, no, they're taking capsules okay. or, or, or generally a capsule form. Um, you can buy yeah. many forms of turmeric. One thing to be aware of, that medication does have some, in, some increased bleeding effects. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not necessarily a free ride if, you, if you're trying to avoid NSAIDs because of bleeding risk if you're taking blood thinners. This isn't necessarily better than that. So just to be aware of that issue. All right. How important is weight control when it comes to arthritis? Isn't there a significant relationship? Isn't osteoarthritis much more common in the weight-bearing joints in people who are obese? Mm -hmm. I think there's two effects of weight. And, uh, and Tom, it, certainly weight control is, uh, is absolutely critical, I think, uh, in arth arthritis management, really of any type. Um, overweight and obesity is a risk factor for all kinds of arthritis, including osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, uh, probably through different ways. Um, part of it's the load. And so certainly for the knee, uh, increased weight and obesity creates a great deal of load that's magnified um, over what you would think it would be. Um, but also uh, increased uh, weight and, and uh, fat in the body creates increased inflammation, which mm -hmm. probably also accelerates osteoarthritis. So for those reasons, very important um, to achieve a healthy weight if you have arthritis or at least to lose weight. Uh, even setting modest weight loss goals can be really important in, in overall managing symptoms and, and preventing progression. So I think those are crucial issues. All right. Our guest is rheumatologist, Mayo Clinic rheumatologist, Dr. John Davis, one of the editors of the book of uh, Living with Arthritis. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about rheumatoid arthritis and maybe get a word of some advice about gout. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Our guest is Mayo Clinic rheumatologist, Dr. John Davis. We've talked about the most common form of arthritis, osteoarthritis, wear and tear arthritis, age the biggest risk factor. A lot of people have it. Uh, now we want to talk about rheumatoid arthritis. Not nearly as common, but as you mentioned, affects women three times as often as men. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that disease. Rheumatoid arthritis is, is kind of my you know thing I sort of specialize in in my practice. Um, it's it's often misunderstood by the general public. Um, it's it's less you know easy to understand what it sort of means. Again, really, it's a condition in which the immune system of a person is attacking one's own joints. And uh, it can come on gradually over years. Sometimes it comes on out of the blue overnight uh, very quickly. So very diverse. It tends to affect small joints and large joints. And so people often a lot of arthritis symptoms in their hands, feet, but also can affect shoulders, hips, knees, ankles, et cetera. Um, very disabling at times. Um, and people can, you know, if, if, when it occurs in, in people who are still working, they may have to go off, off of work for a long time. They may have to change professions even. So. Uh, all encompassing in its effects, even the word arthritis is a bit of a misnomer because it, it goes beyond the joints. It can target other tissues. It can cause eye inflammation, lung inflammation, heart inflammation. So really it's a systemic disease mm. that has some similarities to other autoimmune diseases such as lupus or in others. Is this a family history? More? Family history is, uh, is part of it. About 50% of the risk is probably genetic and, and due to inheriting uh, up to over 100 different genes that may predispose to the disease. 
uh, but also its environment too, because even identical twins do not have the same risk of getting the disease. It's only about a 20 to 40% concordance, hmm. even though the genes are identical. So clearly uh, environment is a factor. Part of that is, um, uh, it, it seems, is smoking is a major risk factor. Obesity is a risk factor. There are other things that we clearly don't understand about, uh, about the environmental factors. If someone comes into you with pain, stiffness, swelling of their joints, you suspect it's rheumatoid arthritis. Is there a test that you can do to prove that it's rheumatoid arthritis? At the end of the day, rheumatoid arthritis is a clinical diagnosis, meaning that really it's the clinician has to decide if the, if the diagnosis is correct. There are tests that can help. We do a test called rheumatoid factor and a test called anti-CCP. And um, those two blood tests are part of the diagnosis, but there are patients who are so-called seronegative, meaning that those antibody tests uh, for the condition are actually negative and, and they can still have rheumatoid arthritis. So it really requires um, a thorough history, physical examination, and some laboratory testing by a rheumatologist or a competent physician to be able to decide if that's the correct diagnosis. Can you ever re reverse this? I mean, if you are diagnosed with this in your 40s mm -hmm. or 50s, 30s, whatever, do you reverse it or is it just something that you're going to have to manage the rest of your days? It's, the outcomes have really improved. Um, even in, in 2019, we don't have a cure for this disease. We're working on it. Um, it. It turns out that just like once you see, you get chicken pox, your body you know, has antibodies, has an immune response to control that virus. Right. So once your body becomes sensitized to your own joints, it doesn't easily unlearn that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at this time, the goal is to achieve remission with medications. And remission means that we basically squelched all the inflammation in the joints and then People who are in remission get pretty close to feeling normal oftentimes, that their pain is, can, be, can be virtually gone or, or infrequent. They have energy levels that are pretty close to normal again. Again, it varies. Sometimes even some of the symptoms linger even if we've, we, we've reduced the inflammation dramatically. Um, unfortunately, a lot of, uh, attaining remission is not everyone, but the outcomes have dramatically improved with current treatment strategies. So, so I think the outcomes have become much, much better. We have many different types of medications to uh, control the inflammation, and that has led to um, improved longevity, uh, improved ability to maintain work, improved ability to um, enjoy uh, life and, and do things um, that one wants to do. So, so uh, th that's the great news about, about rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, truly, the treatments are so much better than they used to be. You mm -hmm. rarely see the patient with the severe hand deformities mm -hmm. that we used to see years ago. So Absolutely. congratulations. And, and you said that you're close to a cure? Uh, of course. <laughs> People are, you know, because we're understanding um, the immune system and understanding better what's going wrong, mm -hmm. um, we're beginning to think how we might be able to reset that. I think I also want to mention there's, there's a great deal of effort going into prevention. So the idea of finding people who are either genetically predisposed or who already have some early signs of reactivity of their immune system to their own joints developing. And then we could potentially do different interventions. We could put them on, on a diet. We could ask them to stop smoking. We could maybe give them a medication and try to prevent them from going on to develop full-blown rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the reason we can do that is because the, I mentioned that one blood test called anti-CCP. It turns out that in people who get rheumatoid arthritis, that antibody is detectable for years before they come down with symptoms. Wow. So now there is actually a prevention trial going on in the United States trying to identify people with those antibodies but without joint inflammation and to put them on a medication called hydroxychloroquine for a year uh, and then see if we can prevent the disease from actually occurring. All right, we don't have much time left, but just a word about gout. And tell us how that is a different type of arthritis, so, how it's different. Yeah, gout is different because it's really a condition in which a chemical called uric acid is building up and depositing in and around the joints, and the uric acid causes episodic flares of really severe inflammation um, in the joints. So oftentimes the, the great toe joint, ankle, knee, for example, and the treatment is really a, aimed at getting rid of those uric acid deposits. We do that by putting people on medications that prevent the formation of uric acid. Um, the main form we dr drug we use is called allopurinol. And if we do that over a period of time and get the uric acid towards a low level in the body, we can sort of eventually stop the attacks from occurring. And that's the difference. If so, if There's one. You've got if, almost cured. If someone <laughs> has gout, are they more likely to have rheumatoid arthritis? Nope. Um, I okay. would say there have actually been some studies suggesting they're less likely to have oh. rheumatoid arthritis. But the two can coexist, um, but uh, we don't see that too commonly. 
The book is called Living with Arthritis, How to Manage Pain and Lead an Active Life. Uh, just like every Mayo Clinic publication, it comes with a 30-day guarantee. <laughs> you order this, you take keep it for 30 days, you don't like it, you send it back, they give you your money back. <laughs> Pretty good. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic rheumatologist, Dr. John Davis. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.